please. You may be seated. Well, I, I think I have 92 reasons to be sure this morning. They're all by way of degrees. If you will, please take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9. I'd just like to read um, this short verse, and then we'll dive in um, this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. In Dan uh, Orthland's book, um, Gentle and Lowly, he said that the Puritans had a practice of taking a verse and wringing it dry um, until they can get every single ounce of application and theology out of it. Well, that's what we're going to do for the next two weeks. We're going to take Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, and we're going to wring it dry. We're going to wring it completely dry. We're going to look at it in light of who we are and ask the Lord to have these, uh, this precious portion of his word shape our thinking for the future. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Hear now the word of the Lord. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything praiseworthy, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass will wither, and the flower will fade. But the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen and amen. Well, let's pray. Holy Spirit, this is your word. These are your people. Bring the two together that the word might have a transformative impact on their hearts and on their minds. I pray that you might speak to them in ways that I simply cannot. I am finite and I am limited in so many ways. But yet you are completely unlimited. Your power is truly amazing. And the way you work in the inward parts is truly glorious. Father, we've beheld you today. Thank you so much that our souls can rest in the worship of you. It desperately needs it. Bless us now in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen and amen. Well, the verses that I just read are particularly powerful verses, and they fall into line with something we've been doing all year. And this year we've set aside to talk about spiritual maturity and what does it mean to grow spiritually? What does it mean to progress in our faith? And for the past three weeks now, we've been looking at our thought life. How do we think? And how does our thought life shape us and who we are? There are very few verses in the Bible that talk extensively about your thought life. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9 is one of them. It is the most comprehensive verse in all of Scripture that lets us know how you and I are supposed to think. This is how God wants us to think. This is how God wants us to think because this is how Jesus Christ thinks. But even more importantly, this is how God wants you to think because this is how you were designed to think. When God created you and he created your mind and he fashioned your mind and he gave you imagination, he gave you the ability to think and reason. That ability, that innate ability that he gave you, was supposed to mirror this. From the very beginning, we were designed, we were created to think only about those things that were true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. These were the things that your mind was created and designed to think. But we all know we don't think like that. Not even on our best day, I don't think like this. And the reason is, is because of sin. 
because we are sinners, because of the fall, our minds are corrupted completely and totally. Even on our best day, we cannot think like this. And so when we read this, we're not reading something even that's unique to Christians. We're reading something that's unique to all human beings. It doesn't matter if they're a believer or an unbeliever. They were designed, they were created to think in this way. I have many unbelieving friends, uh, quite a few. And every now and then they'll say to me, if I call them up or if I just listen to our news, I hear that Christians are narrow-minded closed-minded, or small-minded, right? That's who they say we are. They say, you know, you Christians, you're a bunch of narrow-minded people. You're a bunch of closed-minded people. You're a bunch of small-minded people. And I have no idea what they're talking about. Because when I read this text, I don't see a mechanism for narrow-minded, closed-minded uh, thinking or small-minded thinking. I see thinking that liberates us. I see thinking that unlocks our potential. In fact, if you were to ask me, sin is what causes us to be narrow-minded, small-minded, and closed-minded. You see people whose minds are corrupted by sin. They are some of the most narrow-minded, closed-minded, small-minded people you could ever meet. Think about someone who's overcome with greed. All they can think about is money and how to get more money. Or think about someone who's overcome with lust. That's all they can think about is lust. Or people who are depressed. All they think about is depression. All they think about is how sad they are, right? If anything, sin is the one that narrows your thinking and narrows your mind. That's why Paul says in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. What is Paul saying in that passage? Paul is saying this, sin, this world, conforms, you know, your mind is conformed around this world, meaning it's restricted. Think of a mold. The word for conform there actually means a mold. Something that, that narrows and restricts your thinking, narrows and restricts your mind. Paul says sin and this world, the teachings of this world, the philosophies of this world, Far from liberating your mind, they cause you to be conformed to a way of thinking. And boy, you better watch out if you are not conformed to that way of thinking because you will be ostracized. But Christian thinking is completely different. It doesn't conform. It transforms. In other words, it takes your mind, corrupted by sin, corrupted by your falling nature, and it liberates it. It gives you a, the ability to think rightly. It gives you the ability to think soberly. There is nothing more freeing in the world than when you become a Christian and your mind is completely changed from this sinful, destructive, narrowing pathways of thinking to something that's beautiful and wonderful and amazing. That's the beauty of God's word, that we're not conformed to a particular way of thinking, but our mind now has been transformed and unlocked by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you and I can think rightly. Now look, I'm not preaching from the Bible I normally preach at, and the wind is blowing, so give me a moment or so to get my spot. All right, now I'm good. Look back at verse number eight, and I want to show you from this passage how the Word of God actually unlocks your mind. There are so many of us sitting down here, our mind is in a vice grip of sin. All we think about, our thinking is just so narrow, so pointed. We can't think of anything else. But notice all the things that God says we as Christians are free to think about. All the things that are true, all the things that are honorable, all the things that are just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise. All of these things, the Bible says, are at our fingertips that we can think about. Not the constraining way of thinking. And so what I want to do today, and I'll finish this up tomorrow, is I want to look at these things. But I want to begin by looking at things that are true and honorable. And those things actually fit together. And I want to show you how these two things actually unlock your thinking. It causes you not to be narrow-minded, and it causes you not to be small-minded, and it actually causes you not to think in a very constrained way. And here it is. First of all, 
let's look at thinking that is true and thinking that is honorable. Thinking that's true and thinking that's honorable. Here, Paul is talking about things that are true means things that are comport with reality. Life as it actually is. That's what he's talking about. That's what's true. And what's honorable are those things in our lives that are worthy of doing. Praiseworthy things is what Paul says. That's the things that are honorable, the things that, that we are drawn to do as a result of seeing the truth. Think with me of a traffic light. The traffic light is the best example of what Paul is talking about here in the first two things, true and honorable. When you come to a traffic light, you don't play around with the truth. Everybody knows that green means go, yellow means speed up, and red means stop. Everybody knows that, right? You don't play around with the truth when you come to a, stop, a traffic light because you know what those colors mean. And Paul says, in light of what those colors mean, you drive in that manner. When you come to a, a traffic light and it's red, you stop because that's what you're supposed to do. You don't theorize and say to yourself, well, I know it's red, but we live in a society today where, you know, truth is relative, right? It's amazing to me, everyone talks about truth being relative only when it comes to morality. Only when it comes to morality. When it comes to our sexuality or whether it comes to changing our genders, everyone wants to say truth is malleable. But when they drive up to a traffic light, truth is not malleable there, right? Because now your worldview comes face to face with true truth, as Francis Schaeffer used to say. What is actually true? You see, at the end of the day, each and every one of you know what is true because the law of God has been written on your hearts. You can't get around from the truth. And so the Bible says we are to think of things that are true, and once we find those things that are true, then we think in light of that. We think in light of that. I remember um, uh, one of our children, I can't remember which one, um, a few years ago, several years ago actually, when they were really young, they came to us in the middle of the night. And by the way, if you don't have children, uh, let me tell you, children typically come in the middle of the night to talk about all sorts of things. I don't know why. It's like they can't sleep or they can't talk about things unless it's in the middle of the night. So they came to us in the middle of the night and said, Daddy, there are monsters under the bed. Right? There are monsters under the bed. And I said, I, you know, I was confused. I'm like, what are you talking about? Right? But they, they were saying that there are monsters under the bed. And when I looked at my child, Physiologically, they were acting as if monsters were real. Physiologically, they were scared, they were sweating, they were nervous. They were panicked. Because according to them, monsters were actually under the bed and in the closet. They were everywhere, apparently. Now, I thought to myself in that moment, what if I use this to my advantage? Right? Um, this is good parenting, by the way, right? What if I use this to my advantage? What if I said, you know what? Yes, yes, there is monsters under bed. But they won't eat you unless you eat your vegetables. And they won't eat you unless you go to bed at the prescribed time that I tell you. And they won't eat you unless you pay attention to everything I say to do it, right? Now look, I might have exploited that lie for my own purposes. But you know what? If had I exploited that lie for my own purposes, that would have done nothing for my child. Because they would still have lived in light of a lie. And every time they went into their bedroom, they would think that there were actual monsters underneath the bed. And they would actually think that there's such a thing that monsters that would get them. And so what did I do? I looked at them and I said, you know what? There are no such thing as monsters. There are no such thing as monsters. You read and saw these things, but they're not actually real. And what did I do in that moment? I told them the truth. And you know what happened? Immediately, you could see the relief leave. Immediately, you could see calm brought to the situation. When they were living in light of a lie, they were overcome with panic, overcome with delusions, right? But when they were given the truth, the truth was absolutely freeing to them, absolutely freeing. They could live in light of that. Several years ago, I read a book by a psychologist, a pretty prominent and well-known psychologist, who had been practicing for a long time. 
And he said in all of his years of practicing psychology, doing therapy, all of his years of practicing psychology, the shock therapy, he did aromatherapy, he's had hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of hours of clinical uh, practice and meeting with people. And he said there's nothing in the world that he has tried that was more successful than getting people to tell the truth. Bringing people into conformity with the truth. Getting people to tell their stories that were actually true, right? Not lies, but things that were true. And he said, you know what? Even though it was the most rewarding thing he could do, he said it was the most difficult thing that he has ever seen because he says the human mind, the human being, is so filled with lies that it's so hard sometimes to separate truth from the lie. He said he would spend hours talking to people trying to get them to just tell the truth about who they were, about their upbringing, about things that actually happened, even though he knew that some of these things were false based on things that they had already told them, things didn't line up. People still hold on to lies because that's all of us. We have a view of the world that we try and hold on to with dear life because deep down in our hearts, we are afraid to face the truth. But this eminent psychologist, and I would even say even the Bible tells us that the most freeing thing that we can do, the most rewarding thing that we can do, the most powerful thing to do, if you want to change your circumstance right now, here's what to do. Start telling yourself the truth. Start believing what's true about you. And the easiest place to start, if you're confused, if your mind is filled with so much lies, Right? From, from the moment you were born to now, your mind has been filled with lies. And you say, Pastor Dennis, I don't know how to do that. Here's the easiest place to start. Read God's word. You know, it's interesting to me that Paul starts off by saying whatsoever things were true. Why? Because truth is paramount to each and every one of us. We cannot live life in accordance with God's word and according with God's plan if we're living lives that are filled with lies. And so what's, what's the easiest thing to do? What's the fastest way to reorient your life? What's the fastest way to transform your thinking? Read the Bible because it gives you truth. And as you confront the truth of God's word, you ask the Holy Spirit, you ask the Lord to help you to believe it. Because, see, many people read the Bible. Many people look into the Bible. Many people are exposed to the truth of the Bible. I don't think that's our problem in our day. Our problem in our day isn't that we don't know what the Bible says. Our problem in our day is do we have the faith to actually believe it's true? Do you believe it's true? You see, let me tell you something. Here's the thing with Christianity. Here's the secret of Christianity. As if you've never heard it before. The secret of Christianity is faith. If you believe that Jesus Christ actually came, and if you believe that the Bible is the accurate record of God's word, then all you and I have to do is have enough faith to live our lives in light of it. The problem isn't so much God's word. The problem is our inability to believe that it's true. Because when you don't believe that the Bible is true, guess what happens? You don't live in light of it. And therefore, the Bible says that you live lies. You live absolute lies. And this is why Christianity is so compelling. Because Christianity tells us what truth is. The Bible tells us that when God created us, he created us in a state in which we, there was no sin. He created us with minds that function fully and properly. He created us with wonderful, glorious imagination for us to think about and for us to reason about. There's a book written several years ago called Sapiens, and the author, I think, uh, I can't remember his name right now. It escapes me. But if you, if you just Google the book Sapiens and you read it, it's a fantastic book. It was written by a, a Jewish man who was an atheist. And he said, he said, look, when you look at all the ways Christian, uh, human beings and animals, the ways in which we're similar and the ways in which we're different. He said, if you look at, if you uh, did a comparison of all the ways we're similar and all the ways he's different, we're different, he says the number one difference between human beings and animals is this. We have the power of imagination. 
We have the power of imagination. He said that when, when a gazelle is on the Serengeti eating grass, it's not contemplating the deep things of life. It's not saying, I wonder if I sinned today. It, it doesn't have a conscience, right? It's not thinking about where it's going to go on vacation. It's not thinking about whether they're liked in the pack. They're not doing any of that, he said. He said, Christians have the unique ability to think and reason. In fact, he goes on to say that human beings, above all of God's, above all of creation, all, all, of, all of the known world, human beings have the, have the capacity to think about their thoughts. Animals don't do that. And so as you think about your thoughts and you read uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, I ask you the question, do your thoughts line up to this? Do they? Do you spend time thinking about things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent, things that are praiseworthy? You see, if you're not thinking about those things, then you are not thinking like a human being. You're actually thinking like a beast of the field. Because the beast of the field cannot think of higher order things. Look, Philippians 4.8, these are things that are higher order things. These are things of the soul. These are the things that make us human. These are the things that are at our core, that unlock our ability to use the full potential that God has given us. And when we don't think in light of this, when we believe that we know more than God, or, or when we think that we could think whatever we want to because we're human beings and we're fully autonomous, you are not thinking in light of your nature and how you were created. That's the power of this list. This list is like a mirror that you ought to look into every day and ask yourself the question, am I thinking like this? Because this is what a human being was designed and created to think like. This is what it is. Now, Paul says that whatsoever things are true, but then he says whatsoever things are honorable. When your thinking has been reordered by God, when your mind has truly been transformed by God, only then can you live in light of who God is. In fact, the word for honorable here sometimes carries the idea of worship, that which is worthy of worship. One of the reasons why we struggle to worship, right, is because we don't possess the capacity fully to always think what is true. When you and I get to a point where we're looking into God's word and understanding God's word and soaking in God's word, then and only then can we be able to worship rightly and think rightly. I think Paul starts off with truth and honorable because, quite frankly, if those were the only two things on, those, on this list, that would be enough. That would be enough for all of us. That would be enough to completely transform your thinking. But praise God, he gave us more. And we're going to look at the rest of those next week. But here's the big takeaway I have for you. You ready for it? Here's the big takeaway. Why don't you commit to thinking like you were designed to think? Why don't you commit to that? Look, I don't have access to your mind. Only you do. Only you know the thoughts that you have. But you know what I have access to? God's word. And you know what else we have access to? The Holy Spirit. He searches the heart and he searches the mind. Today, um, we, if you look on the church calendar, we celebrate Pentecost, right? And the whole point of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit coming. And when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said that that Holy Spirit is given to us to teach us truth, to think, teach us what's right, to teach us how to think and how to live. So, so when we think of the Holy Spirit coming, we think of the Holy Spirit giving us the power to think and live in light of God's word. But also this, when the Holy Spirit came, it was a sign that Christ had begun his mediatorial work on our behalf. He is our advocate, and in addition to that, he is our mediator. Christ now in heaven and the Holy Spirit now on earth has given us the power to be able to think like true human beings. If you do not think the way Paul lays out in Philippians 4.8, you're not thinking to your full potential. I will dare say you're not thinking the way God designed you to think. You're thinking like a beast of the field. 
But today I want to challenge you that there's hope. You don't have to be a prisoner of your own mind. You don't have to be trapped with thoughts of lust. You don't have to be trapped with thoughts of sadness and depression. You don't have to be trapped. You don't. There's freedom. But that freedom only comes through a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. That freedom only comes when the Holy Spirit is in you, abiding with you. That freedom only comes when you read God's word and commit yourself to living in light of it. That's the only time that freedom has come. And when you are set free, you are set free to be more human, to be the way God has called you to live and to act. My prayer for you is that you will lay hold of Philippians 4.8 and commit through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ's mediatorial work, to think in this way. Cast off your stinking thinking. Stop thinking people are out to get you. Stop people think, stop thinking that the world is an awful place. Stop, stop the conspiracy and the lies that live in your head. And instead, grasp the freedom that comes with being in union and communion with Christ. I promise you, when you lay hold of Christ, your thinking will explode in a good way to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we certainly thank you for your word. Oh, Father, there is freedom in thinking the way Paul lays out in Philippians 4 8. Lord, even if all of us here commit to just thinking that which is true, ordering our stories that it reflects the story of your word, ordering our own personal stories that we stop believing the lies that are in our head. Lord, if we, if we just commit to doing this one thing, Lord, I just know how transformative it would be for so many of us, for all of us, because all of us are plagued with minds that feed us lies, lies about ourselves, lies about the people that we love and care about, lies about the world. Lord, all of us have monsters underneath our intellectual beds, our thinking beds. And they are causing us to live in panic and worry. But you want to set us free. I pray that through your power, through the Holy Spirit, through your word, that we can truly be set free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.